Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Vaughn. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast. How are you today? I'm wonderful, Michael. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm really delighted that you shown interest to come on the podcast. And I'm also really interested to hear your story. And uh, as we were talking just before that we press record, we have something in common, which hopefully will come out during the podcast. I've been in the textile industry for a very long time. So it's you're probably my first ever guest that is in the text from the textile kind of clothing arena. So uh, I'll ask my first question to get the ball rolling. And that is, tell us a little bit about you. Where were you born? Where did you go to school? Uh, any further education? Um, did you move around? What about your first job, your career? And then, of course, I want to know, how did you get to what you're doing today. So over to you, Vaughn. Well, thank you. Um, I'll give you the, uh, the shortened version to, to keep it simple. I was raised, I was born in a little small country town on a horse farm. So I was born in Blythewood, South Carolina, which is right outside of Columbia. And I grew up, you know, I'm a second generation haberdasher, right? Or clothing guy for people that don't know what a haberdasher is. But I grew up on a horse farm um, I would muck stalls and, and trim fence lines mm. and mend fences and all that jazz. And I thought that was hard work. Uh, but then when I didn't do that, I'd come in, you know, growing up, I played baseball and football. I was an athlete. I have one brother. And so, you know, back, back then I grew up where, you know, we had 20 some odd acres and I'd go run in the woods all day on a Saturday after Great. chores were done. And then I, you know, I, I love spending time with my father. And so I would come to work on Saturdays from time to time and shine shoes. And so anyway, just kind of had a typical childhood. Um, went, uh, was a better baseball player than football player, but right. uh, played ball through high school and then applied to three colleges. Uh, two of them, one of them told me don't bother. One of them told me that I had a chance to play baseball, but it'd be a long path. And then the third one was the University of South Carolina. They actually said they gave me an academic scholarship and paid me to come to school. So I'm not a rocket scientist, but I do know that free college versus me <laughs> having to pave this hard path seemed like a good deal. So yes. I took, took that choice, uh, which is also located in Columbia. And me and my parents, we had a deal that if I got a scholarship to, to college, they would buy me a car and they would set me up with living expenses for six months. And as long as I maintained my scholarship, yeah, that I was good. And if, and if I didn't, then I also picked up all the, the debt that came with school at that point. Yeah. So I'm rocking along and I have my six months stipend. I'll never forget. I was like three weeks in. Um, and I ran out of money. Like oh. I, I found out that I was three really weeks. good at party. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> three weeks and oh. I'm like, I'm broke. And so oh. I was like, well, damn, I'm not going to ask for more money, but I don't mind asking for a job. So I, I called my father and I said, Hey, can I have lunch with you? He said, sure. And we talked about school <laughs> and things like that. And I said, um, Hey, I, I've got some extra time. Can I come work in our shipping and receiving room, opening up boxes, at the store. And he's like, sure, absolutely. And um, so during school I had, I was always, I ended up marrying, I'm married to my high school sweetheart. She went to a different. Oh. So I set it up. So after my first semester, I never had a Monday or a Friday class. So I always had four day weekends. Right. And I worked in the back room, opening up boxes. I always had some little hustle going on, whether it was being a waiter or a bartender or a bouncer yeah. Selling T-shirts. Uh, and then I would go see her every other weekend. And then every other weekend she would come down. And so we just did that for four years. But after our junior year and going into our senior year, I'll never forget it. I was working at the shop and we used to eat lunch together as a family. So we got lunch and came back and uh, I, we started talking and I'd interviewed a bunch of attorneys and doctors because, you know, they make a lot of money uh, mm. at least especially when you're looking at it, you know, you're a junior or going into your senior year and it's like, I want to make some money. 
uh, mm. when I graduate. Mm. So I'm sitting there talking to my parents and they're like, so what do you want to do? You don't want to go to law school? And I said, no, nah, really, you know, I think we were about two weeks going back to our senior year. And I said, no, nah, I'd really like to just come work as a salesperson when I graduate. Yeah. Here. And they were like, absolutely not. And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, no, this, this is way too hard. Like you, you're too smart for that. And I, and I said, look, y'all are really starting to offend me. Mm. Either give me a job or I'm going to work for a competitor. I don't care. And they yeah. said, no, we'd love to have you. But the whole point was, you know, they, they wanted me to make my own decision um, mm. and not assume that I wanted to come into the family business. And, and kind of a key moment in there, and we can probably come back to this later. I interviewed an attorney and he said, Vaughn, there are a lot of broke attorneys out there. He said, let me ask you something. He's like, do you take, do you want to work for someone or do you want to work for yourself? And I said, uh, I want to work for myself. He's like, do you like someone telling you what to do or do you like to tell yourself what to do? I was like, no, I love it. I don't like it when people tell me what to do. He's like, <laughs> why, don't you go, why don't you be a business owner? But that kind of sparked, you know, me coming to them and asking to be a salesperson. But at that same lunch, I said, and guys, while I'm thinking about it, I said, Aaron, who's my wife, I said, you know, she's pretty hot and she's put up with a lot of stupid stuff of me being in college over the last three years. I think, I don't think I'm going to do much better. I'm pretty sure I need to ask her to marry me or else I might lose her. Yeah. And so I called her father that right in that moment. I met with him two hours later. I asked if I could marry his daughter and I proposed that evening. So two weeks before going back to senior year, I knew what I was doing when I was graduating and my wife now or fiance or girlfriend at the time said yes to marrying me. So all of my major life decisions were done over one lunch. Wow. Uh, two weeks before going into my senior year, went, graduated college, um, came to work. Fast forward to two, that was 2005, 2007, 2008, somewhere in there. I became a partner, an equal partner in our retail operation. We had our first child. I went and bought the partner's house, uh, the two new cars. My wife tells me she's pregnant. The recession of 08 hits. We have a yeah. first child. I got shingles because I was so broke. Yeah. I could, I was one paycheck away from, because we, we skipped like three months worth of paychecks to keep our employees on staff. Yeah. Um, and I, I was over leveraged. And so I was literally sitting upstairs quarantined away from my family with shingles while my wife was going through postpartum with our daughter. Yeah. And then, uh, that was 2008. And then fast forward now to, to 2021 and I'm still an equal partner in that operation. Um, that same partnership owns a manufacturing business. We, I, in 2016, I started my own company uh, as a way to spread my wings and build a platform that that I wanted to, that I would want to work for because retail is tough. And I came from a very traditional retail work six, seven days a week background. Yeah. And, and I mean, there are a lot of, there's a cost attached with that. And so now I, I, you know, I own multiple businesses. I have three children. I have my oldest just turned 13. Um, yeah. And I'm a, I'm a day or two days away from turning 39 myself. So, uh, you know, now I, I consider myself a business owner who happens to be in the apparel industry and I, and I coach entrepreneurs and, and salespeople specifically with families on, on how to manage all of it. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the short version of how we got here. <laughs> well, okay. I, I have a question. So you, you, what's your father's business that you mm -hmm. started to do some work in? Yep. in the back in the back room whatever and what kind of business was his what do so you do this is a traditional brick and mortar uh, men's apparel business so it was I mean, oh, okay. we do tailor, so tailored clothing um yeah. but you know very much so like when i first started working it was six days a week we didn't work on sundays but it was nine to six every single day that the doors were open whether we were busy not busy yes and then that which means getting there at 7 30 and staying to to 7.30 for the, the open and the closing stuff. That's it, yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking back on it, you know, I, I try to live without any regrets, but I remember my wife, I mean, we did, you know, we, were, we weren't making much money, but she basically, for probably the first 
God, three years. We were basically, I mean, we loved each other, but we were basically roommates because, I mean, hell, I was never there. I was working all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's tough, definitely. Yeah, that's tough. And um, so the apparel business with your dad, did you get mm-hmm. a love for that product uh, when so you were doing that? Or? I, yeah. I, so now coaching people, I think clothes can be very transformational. Um, yeah. I'm not the, like my brother is much more artistic and creative than I am. He actually owns barber shops, but yeah, you know, I, clothes were, I'm going to call it a widget. I love business. So I got into it for business. I right. developed a love of clothes. And especially when you get the opportunity, the kind of two business models, the way that I see it, or two types of customers, you got the people that are, tra- you know, transactional, they just don't buy stuff and go whatever. Hmm. But then you people that really, and this is a part of the business, and this is how my other company is called Liam John, named after my third child, uh, right. first son. Um, scariest thing I did was have a third child. Second scariest thing I ever did was start a business from scratch. Uh, so yeah. I, I decided to name them the same thing. But um, <laughs> like we work with clients, specifically men, and help them create their own brand. Like, and we, and we, we go through this process that I think is really neat because most guys have a closet this this big and wear 20% of it over and over and over again and feel good in that 20%. But most guys don't know how, like they see a vision of themselves in their head, but they don't know how to execute on it with clothes. Yeah. And, and so we have a process where we get an understanding of that. And then we start basically writing a prescription, if you will. Right. Hey, buy this, not that. Get this, not that. That doesn't look good. That's not in line with who you are and what you want to be. Yeah. And we build this out. And then what's really cool, Michael, is when you do that, like there's this air of confidence that comes out. And a guy, mm. it's almost like watching a woman put on a, the best analogy is when you see a woman put on a pair of shoes and her, her personality instantly changes because she feels different in them. Like yeah. when you get to see a guy do that, and we don't talk about that, I don't think a lot as men, but when you feel no. confident in your clothes, like that right there is kick ass. That's what I love about the business. Like that's the fun part. Right. Because it, I mean, it, it, it impacts your relationships. It impacts your self confidence. You're going to sell more. I mean, you know, look good, play good. Like it matters and it makes a big, big difference in, in our, quite frankly, our performance, I think, as men. So that part I love. Um, yeah. Beautiful cloths and fabrics and things like that. Like, I, I think that's beautiful. And the story lines and everything around it's really neat. But at the end of the day, what I love is seeing someone walk out of the dressing room and be like, yeah, this is cool. Mm-hmm. So this is, so is that, did you start out with that premise or... Did that develop? I mean, so what, what I'm trying to get straight in my head yeah. in your timeline, and I know you're saying you've got a number of businesses. So I'd like to unpick that a little bit. So tell me each different business and what it does. So all of them. So you have Granger Owings, which is my partnership with my father and another gentleman. So that is a very much retail oriented business. Um, yeah. That's tailored clothing. Then we do the manufacturing because back in 2000 and five we realized that you know we were having issues with vendors and and if you're gonna spend a lot of time like putting out fires and dealing with issues why not just make it a vertical business so we started that and that's turned out to be really really cool especially when you pair that with strong you know vendors that are good partners so I, i think that creates a deal and then liam john is is really that is kind of my playground as i call it That's really a company I built because I wanted autonomy, but I didn't want to step away from my current partnership. My two partners are a little bit older, so I wanted to grow. I mean, I'm the guy that wants to fly on the private jet, right? Um, Yeah. That's not necessarily their goals, and that's cool. We're just at different stages and, and have different goals. And I was like, I don't, you know, a lot of people end up in this or conversation. Like, I can either do this or this. And I was like, damn it, I don't want to do that. I want to do and. I want to keep this and yeah. build my own business. So I figured out a way to do that and created like a, a nice structure so that they actually 
get a royalty for the success of my business. Um, just okay. as a as a homage, because I wouldn't have been able to do it without them. Like I would yes. never been exposed to it. And I'm, you know, I mean, they're family. And so I have a lot of loyalty there, but really that, that model is all about, oh, I should probably back up. I'm sorry, Michael. Um, I hate retail because standing in a four by, you know, four walls all day, whether you're busy or not busy, that sucks. And if you've never done it, you need to go work retail. And I think you'd really appreciate the people who do <laughs> yeah. it. But yes. I was like, man, this is crazy. And we had a direct sales force that would go hunt prospects. And I said, what if we did, like, what if I took their strategy of going and prospecting and getting referrals and really creating these deep relationships with their clients and paired that with all the tools you have as a retail, like with all the merchandise and stuff you have as a retail shop. And I did that and I personally built a business. I was personally selling a million and a half dollars worth of clothes a year by appointment only. I mean, it was, it was fantastic. Mm. And I was like, this is really neat. What if I were to create an entire business model where people who want to do what I do could have this opportunity without having all the risk of owning a business and all the headaches that come along with it? And so I created Liam John as just that. It started off as a direct selling company. We would come to your house or office and counsel you on clothes and then build you, you know, a custom solution, custom wardrobe. Yeah. And yeah. then it's morphed into a, a brick and mortar retail. Um where we show other vendors, we have ready to wear garments and product, but also we have a strong emphasis and background on custom. So we can create a, a comprehensive solution from blue jeans and t-shirts all the way up to formal attire and everything in between, but you just have a relationship with your stylist. So, you know, you have their cell phone, you call them, you can meet them at the shop, at your house, at your office. And it's really, it's a hundred percent built around catering to the customer and getting really deep, relationships with people so that you're like you're their guy or girl if you will like they they probably spend 90 percent of the dollars that they spend on clothes they spend it with one of us one of our stylists and that's that's the business model it's 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 going against all of the let's let's trajectory that everyone is seeing which is online, Amazon, fast fashion, throwaway mm -hmm. fashion, wear it once, throw it away. Yep. So you, you're, that's a brave step <laughs> because it's going against everything where consumers are being drawn to and being yeah. pulled in, being sucked into something that they buy online, they get delivered, it doesn't fit right. It doesn't look right, but they've paid for it. They've got to wear it, you know, and then after one night they go, send it back. I don't yep. want it anymore. So who, obviously you, <laughs> decided, I, I, you have an online as well, don't you? Yep. Yeah. You've got online. So you're, you're covered there. But the rest of it, the main part of what you're doing and the main kind of philosophy that I'm hearing is going against all that. So I, I'm kind of going, that's a brave step. So why did you do it? Well, I mean, so I view it like a carousel, right? Like on the, on the playground, hmm. you have online, you have, I'm going to call that transactional relationships. And yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, there was a book written called Hug Your Customer, and it was, it was written by a retailer. And the whole premise was serve your client. And mm. I think when you talk about scale and, and online and Amazon, it seems very much, it's very superficial. Mm. But I think that what I'm trying to do specifically is if that's the best way to serve you, so like our online presence right now has not been our priority. We started with a very high touch, high, high relationship driven custom model. And that's been, I mean, it's been fantastic. And, but I, I like right now we're in the, in a growth phase and I, 
I know that we can help more people if they know what we do. Yeah. And sometimes the easiest way to introduce that conversation is with the first transaction because money is really just an exchange of trust, right? So Amazon, like we've sold on Amazon before and they protect the consumer. I mean, it's all of their policies and payouts and everything is really built to protect the buyer, which is really yeah. cool. Um, so all you want to do is trust. And so like we, we've turned, we've kind of outgrown and we started in the trunk of a car. Uh, we all the way up to what's now a 1500 square feet showroom with a national partnership with Johnny O, which is a casual wear line and, and some other vendors. So you can come in and buy a shirt, but when you buy a shirt from us, we're going to have a conversation just as a normal human being, just like you and I, Michael, and, mm -hmm. and find out, Hey, if you need help, here's what we do. We'd love to help you at no extra charge other than, I mean, you're just buying the merchandise. It's not like you're paying a fee for that. It's not like a subscription based business model. It's just like, Hey, if this would be beneficial mm -hmm. to you, we're here. So I don't think it's really, to me at least, like traditional, like go buy a car. I always feel like I'm getting taken advantage of, but I have someone in the car business that I trust, right? So when I want, and I like cars, so when I want a car, I just call, call him. Yeah. And there's trust there. And for me, you know, I spend, I'm an expert at what I do for my clients. I genuinely seek out experts in other fields. So that I can say, here's what I want. Please let me know if I'm making a mistake here. But also, I, I just want to pay you to be the expert because I don't, I don't want to spend the time to learn that. And I think that that's really the opportunity here. It's not so much, hey, the other stuff doesn't work. It does work. But I think there's a real opportunity in the marketplace to just be a trusted resource when it comes to looking good and feeling confident in your clothes. And if that means that you're buying from us online, fantastic. If that means you'd like to come in the store and talk to your stylist, whatever that looks like, we're here for you. I mean, we do a lot of business via text message and FaceTime. And I mean, during yeah. the pandemic, we really didn't, aside from the initial you know, surge, um, our business was up, which is pretty impressive because we were highly relational. People weren't in the office as much. I mean, they go from wearing suits and ties and feeling confident. Now they don't know how the hell to dress casual. Or like no. right now they're coming out of quarantine and they're like, holy cow, I'm not the same size or like, yeah, I'm looking a little rock. And now you're navigating business casual. So all of it, it, the mindset is all about serving the client and just being mm -hmm. a trusted provider for that. And with technology, I mean, it's, I mean, this is pretty cool. You and I having a conversation that I would have never even been able to talk to you two, three years ago, much mm -hmm. less see your face. And yeah. it's, it's just really cool how you can reach people with technology, but the whole concept of us is serve, serve, serve. Um, it's it's um, because you're going really against the trend. Mm -hmm. You are also, I mean, your timing must be superb because I think people are, I mean, I was using Zoom way before the pandemic you know, like at least for three or four years. But I could never get any of my podcast guests on Zoom because they didn't have it. They didn't know how to work it. So we use Skype, right? And because it was only audio, it was fine. I didn't have to record people's faces. But now we've got Zoom. It's easy. You know, I could put all my ecosystem for interviews on Zoom. Now, so the point that I'm making really is that after a while, I definitely suffered from Zoom burnout because there were so many events, networking this, meeting this, but I went, enough. I'll just use it for my podcast and I'm not going on another Zoom call again. I don't yeah. want to anymore, <laughs> you know. And there is a – and I think it's the same with, you know, online buying just buy this online buy that online buy this one and there's a point where people are going enough already i just want to go into a store feel it and speak to a real person about it so you're going against the trend but you're also really well positioned 
to get the rebound where people just don't want to do online anymore. And because it's inevitable, you know, it's inevitable. People are going to get fed up with their phones being on it and they realize, God, I must just get rid of this phone and stop looking at it, you know, yeah. because we've all been conditioned. So, so I, I think it's brave, but also I think it's a metaphor for all businesses out there to say, for sure, go online. But if you haven't got in person going on as well, and more importantly, encourage it, you are going to miss out big time because people are ready to rebound to wanting to be with someone. For sure. Um, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, I see puzzles, right? So I, I, I'm ADD off the charts and I view it as a superpower <laughs> because I see things that I don't think a lot of other people see. But like, if you just look at Amazon, hmm. Amazon is coming into retail, which is not a secret, but if you really think about it, they started as an online platform only. And now they're going into Whole Foods and Kohl's and all these different places so that they can get, like build a, a personal relationship, in-person yeah. personal relationship with their client. When you start seeing big companies like that coming from an online only platform into the retail space, to me at least, they're not dumb. They pay a lot of people a lot of money to figure that out. Yeah. I should be doing the same thing. Now, if I'm already in retail, then I should definitely be looking at the online platform as well. Because mm. it does, just because they're going, I mean, just because they started from online and going into retail, is I think that's a harder transition, quite frankly. Mm. They're going from retail to online. But but I but I think again, you have to offer both. And what's really interesting, Michael, is like, I mean, before. Like you have to, I mean, that was a lot of money to go online to a platform. Now you look, you got Shopify, you got Zoom, yeah. you got all these different technologies that you don't have yeah. to have a custom coded solution. No. And if you do, you're tweaking a few things. It's so affordable. Yeah. Like, and it's, and it's just another way to serve your clients. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. I think it's one of the coolest. I was having a conversation with my two daughters last night, one out on a date. And, it was just the three of us and we were chatting. They were like, Dad, you know, what's changed? Because my birthday is coming up. They're like, what's changed in, in your lifetime? I was like, well, golly, we didn't have laptops and, and smartphones and all these things. I was like, y'all have access to information so much faster than, than I did growing up. Mm. It's incredible. I mean, you can go on Instagram now and you can direct message someone and it's literally the equivalent of having their cell phone and sending them a text message. I mean, it's yeah. pretty easy to talk to damn near just about anybody. It doesn't yeah. guarantee that they'll answer you, but that's pretty amazing. Mm, scary. Scary. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so for your own business, not your partnership business, yeah. where is the manufacturing done for that? So we do a lot of that. Um, we actually use our, manufacturer. Uh, so we do a lot of that in Portugal and Italy, a little bit of Thailand, a little Vietnam. Um, yeah. All the fabrics come from either Italy or England. Um, right. You know, it's, uh, we're very much purist um, right. in terms of that. So like all of our brand and stuff is going to be that caliber. Um, and then, you know, our vendors that we use inside of our store. So Johnny O, they're a West Coast kind of SoCal prep line, really cool stuff. But the guy that started Peter Millar, which was wildly successful, is now their C, uh, chief merchandising, their CMO, the chief mer merchandising officer. You know, he's turning that into a collection. So what we do is we try to partner up very heavily with vendors that are excellent in their core business. I mean, we have a company that does just belts, like really nice, nice belts. And, yeah. you know, if you come in our store, you'll see 40 of their belts displayed. You know, it's probably a, I don't know, it's probably close to a 18 or if I got 40 at $800 a piece, whatever that is, 
you know, it's a very significant investment to come see, mm. Mm. but we cut the belt to your exact size. So you're like, we literally, we, we cut it right there on the spot so that you're in the middle hole. You're exactly. kidding. Exactly. Yeah. It's so cool. And, but it's just, <laughs> that's all we do. Um, and it's just, so we've got Italy, we've got some, some stateside things, you know, like the belt company I was telling you about, they're made in Nashville, I believe, or in Tennessee. You know, we've got a, a great shoe supplier that we enjoy out of Italy. That was mm. a big designer for, you know, some of your real famous stuff, but he's like, Cali, the $3,000 shoe is really hard to justify. So we've got them in there for six ninety five, seven ninety five, but they look like pieces of art. Um, yeah. So it's just, it's finding right, the right partners, um, people mm. that you can trust and you develop a nice relationship with and you work well, and then, you know, you, you just ride it and enjoy it. And so share. the, it's so interesting. You keep mentioning Italy. Um, so I, I used to be in the textile industry as we discussed earlier for 28 years, but I worked for these mills, um, in fabrics that had to produce millions of meters. And the retailer, the main retailer we sold to, um, the biggest one was Marks and Spencer. But we send them, send the fabric to the cutters that supplied Marks and Spencer. But at the time, it was a very integral relationship. So Marks and Spencer, they chose the fabrics. They decided uh, how many yards, meters they needed for their, for their, um, you know, their ranges um, for the season. And they would just nominate us to send the fabric to that cutter, that cutter, that cutter, you know. And the thing was, it was business on a plate for all those cutters because they literally just had to wait. They had to make a sample, but then that's about all they did, you know, and they were just given the orders. Times changed, obviously, significantly since then. But what I'm leading up to is Italy. Now, Italy were like the, the <laughs> they messed everything up because everybody loved everything from Italy. It was so beautiful. It was so, you know, bella. It was just so, it was, oh. It's and you, sexy. I know. It's just. But we used to go to these fairs and we saw the Italians and you looked at their ranges and went, how the hell? Because we had these mills that could never produce anything like it because we had to have rows and rows of the same machines and nothing was interesting, you know. But as a sales guy, you'd look at these ranges and go, oh, my God, what I would do for those fabrics, you know. And they, they are the most innovative of all the kind of producers that I've ever seen in my years that we were that, so jealous of them. Well, I think the cool thing, Michael, it, they're artists. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're, they're based. I mean, because I, I mean, buying tie fabric in Como, I mean, right. So like, <laughs> Como, I mean, and having lunch right there lakeside and yeah. It's just, there's so much, but it's all about the process for them. Yes. And they pour, they're not worried about cutting 10 million yards. No. They want it beautiful. Now, it can be a real pain in the ass in American yeah. culture. <laughs> yes. But I think there's a lot to be said for it. Um. And I think, quite frankly, one of the things we're dealing with supply chain right now is everyone mm. got so much. It was either like let's cut infinity inventory or let's cut like on demand, like keep levels so low that it's on demand. Well, now you've got this lag. And I think there's a real opportunity for some for artists. I'm going to call them that are whether they're fabric producers or there's a niche yeah. Or scarcity, like not unlimited supply of you. So, I mean, even, you know, if you're a business owner or if you're in the textiles or if you want to be a fabric maker, you know, there's a lot to be said for only having so many that you can offer and charge a premium. I mean, 
I just yeah. got some beautiful fabrics on my desk. You know, you'll appreciate this. I, I look at freaking, I swatch dust over all over me all the time. Yeah. And I got this beautiful uh, alpaca and cashmere mixed with wool, uh, beautiful soft hand sport coats, but they've only got enough to make like 10 coats each. It's 40 swatches, 10 coats. They're selling them all over the, the States. And when it's gone, yeah. it's gone. But it's two hundred and fifty dollars yeah. a meter fabric, yeah. And it, and it's like, man, that's crazy. But people are buying it because it's it's beautiful, it's unique, it's a great story. Um, oh yeah, you just said that. you've just you just said the magic word. It's story. There's a story behind it, and if it's coming from Italy, it's like okay for the. Italian Americans, it's heaven, I'm sure. But for anybody, it's going because it's magical, it's romantic, it's there is a story behind it. Especially if there's like only limited supply, then well, if I don't make a decision right now, next week it's gone. So, and I think that's, I mean, I do a lot with, so you asked me, so I do a lot with personal branding. And yeah. one of the things that I think is, especially with social media, there's a, there's a pressure to be liked by everyone. Mm -hmm. But part of being successful, um, there's a scripture that says God will make room for your talents. And I'm paraphrasing there, but, but basically mm -hmm. the point that I'm getting to is in business, if you get very clear on your purpose, whether you're a business owner or an employee, if you really think about who you are and what is your truth and who's your, yeah. like, who are you really in your heart of hearts? And if you step into that, it is crazy how your audience will find you because they're literally seeking you and how much business success you can have by just being true to that. Period. And that's a purpose. And I think when you see Italians do it or a great coach or and they find that audience and they and they stay true to themselves, it's incredible how much business will come flooding to you and yeah. how much you can charge because they really value what the hell you do. It's mm -hmm. I mean, it's just that, but it, it, that's scary because you, you kind of like, well, if I do this, I can only. I can only help so many people. And it's like, well, yeah, but how many people do you really have to help if you're charging a premium, if you're really that good? Yes. Um, it's just an interesting, it's an interesting time because like you don't have to be vanilla. You know, no. I, I watched the, uh, the free guy the other day. I mean, if you're, a, if you're really bubblegum flavored ice cream, just be bubblegum flavored ice cream. And the people that like bubblegum flavored ice cream will eat you. <laughs> like yes. that's it. Period. It's pretty straightforward. It's not very hard. No. So where, where does this personal branding then fit in? So is that a separate part of, of your offering? You, you coach people with this as well? Yeah, I coach people with that. I, it really kind of feeds in. It just, I, I don't know. It just is all intertwined to me. I, it actually took me hiring someone as a PR person. And she was like, Vaughn, all that you do is help people with their confidence and like their brand. Yeah. And you think about it, like all of us have a brand. Like if you go into, like I'm looking at your backdrop, my backdrop is kind of spotty because I my I have a retail office, which means we'll get interrupted. But like but if I look my, at your my backdrop is fake, by the way. Well, it looks very pretty. But it doesn't uh, look, but it doesn't look fake, does it? No, no, so, it looks fantastic. Yeah. But I'm sitting there going like we, like our house look, our homes, our cars, our personality, our accents, like all of that is a very unique comp combination of who you are yeah you can take that where you go and i think that if you build a personal brand because i'm i'm all about access for anyone right so it doesn't mean that everybody deserves the same things because not everybody puts in the same amount of work but it means that everybody should have the opportunity for anything right yeah so if you look at personal branding that's something that anyone can do everyone has a brand hmm whether they choose to pay attention to it or not is their own business because yes. that's their choice. But the truth of the matter is, I think if a lot of people were to just pay attention that they are a business or a product, depending on how you want to look at it, it could change a lot for them if they just paid attention to it 
and started building yeah. it. I mean, you know, if you've ever worked with someone like the cream always rises to the, to the top. Like I've never worried about money and finances. I've always just worried about doing the best I can. Mm. The money's always just happened as a result of it. Mm. Like that's kind of like the scorecard, but it's never been the purpose behind it. It's always been, Hey, let me just be a badass at what I'm doing. I'm going to make mistakes, but let me just keep working on it. But I'm going to carry myself in a way that when I do mess up, I'm going to correct it. And I don't know any, I mean, I'll take my chances with someone that's willing to commit to getting the result any day of the week, regardless of a resume. And I think, especially now you look at unemployment and everybody talks about this and that. It's like, what are you, are you kidding me? Like, Now's a wonderful opportunity, wonderful opportunity if you're not where you want to be in the hierarchy of a company to really run the ranks because people are paying more attention to that now than ever. And if you're in a mm. shitty situation where somebody doesn't appreciate you, it's really easy to go find another opportunity if you are strong enough by yourself, aka have a strong enough personal brand. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, yeah, I do coach a lot on that, and that, but I don't know if that answered your question. I, it does kind of. I, I think you know you're you have many different flavors in your flavor ice cream, and um, it kind of shines through that. You know, it's it's kind of your your clothing the individual kind of externally, but also internally at the same time and you know the two are you know not exclusive they're kind of merged together and a very important part of who people are and again i think not especially guys we don't necessarily always know this um we haven't got an instinct about it we've got to be you know educated we've got to be told about it uh, to be able to appreciate and realize it. Um, and I think that's, that's, I genuinely, I haven't had anybody on to talk about textiles, which was my, let's call it my first love in business. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to talk about, cause I'm about storytelling. That's why my podcast is called share your story. I teach people about storytelling. Personal branding is about storytelling about who you are. And people don't really, a lot of businesses still do not appreciate storytelling. I was watching a video the other day by, you know, these um, apps that where you can do all your accounting online. And I was having this particular torrid time with this one company who decided to increase their prices for no extra value right in the middle of the pandemic. <clears throat> and I took great exception to that. Um, and I managed to get a discount, so I'm pleased about that. But they posted a video where three people it was a very clever video, they were promoting, they were going in partnership with somebody, and they literally just bored the pants off me by saying, We're putting, you know, we've got this feature, we've got that feature, it's a great partnership, you know, uh, you can do this with it, you can do that with it, you can do this with it, you can do that with it. And I'm like, Where's the story? You know, yeah. I don't hear a story. What What's in it for the client, the accountant? You know, what is he or she getting out of this new partnership? Not about what you can do. It's about what's in it for them. What will that do to their life, their story? And so many organizations don't get it. I mean, successful organizations even don't get it. Uh, how they become successful, God only knows. Well, I do know. It's advertising, just just beating the hell out of advertising. That's how they get well, successful. I mean, when I think, I mean, I, I follow this guy. There's a company called Lions, um, not Sheep. dot com. This guy named Sean Whalen started it. Yeah, they're doing over a million dollars a month in t-shirt sales. I mean, they're selling thirty dollars hats and t-shirts. They started in 2018, and I'm sitting there going, "Holy cow!" But if mm. you look. They're telling a story. They're yeah. all, I mean, they're all about telling a story. Social media, you, I mean, personal brand. If you're, I mean, I call it, 
whatever. Uh, I'll come back to that. But like, mm. have your name and tell your story, the good and the bad and the ugly. Yes. And let people know because what it's going to do, I mean, that's why personal branding, you know, people might know Vaughn Granger or they might know Granger Owens or they might know Liam John, but if they know me, they're going to know all of that. They're going to know. And I'm comfortable sharing because it, it, I'm just open and honest anyway. Um, mm. But I talk about the good and the bad, you know, like it's easy for me to be a workaholic. Yeah. I've had, you know, I, I've been at points in my life where I haven't had enough money. I've had, you know, good times in my marriage. I've had not great times in my marriage. Typically when it's not a good time of marriage is because I'm not pouring into my wife like I should be and paying attention and appreciating the door. And so, but you share that stuff and people are like, well, shit, this person's real. And, yes. and that stuff shows inside of your company. And if you own a company or if you're a leader and we're all leaders in some way, shape or form, That's you're, right. you're, whatever you're leading is going to take on your personality. And, yeah. and that's super important. And the more you share your story, assuming it's a good story, it, <laughs> they'll, you know, they want to follow you because they're part of it. They want to see you be successful. And it, sure, there'll be some people like, you know, and it's always uncomfortable. I started posting videos during the pandemic and I was like, I was petrified of taking a video and, and posting it and people would say things. And then I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm not looking at the comments. And I did that for like 90 days. And then I started getting text messages from people that have my cell phone that told me how much they appreciated what I was sharing. And yeah. then they started telling me how they took one or two things and applied it in their life. And then I started, I was like, holy crap, this is cool. And then I started a coaching program based off of, wow, I, this is a value. This can help people. Yeah. Um, but like literally all of it is, is stemmed from this thing that we're all architects of our own life. Um, to an extent and, and that we have the power to design if we get real clear on what we want. And there's a lot of opportunity in that, but there's also a lot of suffering if, if you can't identify what you want. So, and, and I think all of that's through personal branding, confidence, yeah, acting when you're fearful, being courageous, really. Cause I mean, the fear never goes away. I don't, I've, I've always been scared. Uh, <laughs> like it just changes. The zeros might change or whatever, but it's like, it still gets a little hairy. Sure thing. So. Wow. Well, um, there's so many questions that keep popping up in my head that I want to ask you, but, um, one, one thing that I want to ask you is how many stores do you have right now? And so right what's the plan? I what's the plan? So the plan is um, right now we have three locations in total. Um, I have three other markets identified for growth. And right now I've been spending the last six months really fine tuning and getting the right leaders in place uh, for the process and technology to automate and control certain parts of our process so that it's scalable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the plan is really to expand our brick and mortar footprint. Uh, you're going to see a big expansion of our online platform um, and and really just providing a platform. One of the reasons I like being in business is I always tell people my job is to make sure our best talent doesn't outgrow me. And so mm -hmm. my job is to always be creating growth opportunities. Um, we just recently hired six people under the age of 25 that are wow. excellent young talent that are hungry. Um, and while other people can't find labor, we're finding what I would consider way beyond labor. We're finding real talent, but mm. the, the kicker is you have to have room for them to grow because they want to grow quickly. Um, yes. And so it's really just creating that opportunity. And I think that's, I mean, that's my biggest job right now is being the visionary of how do we grow in a way that's sustainable um, and, and taking process so they're not like custom is beautiful, but custom is hard to scale in terms of custom solutions. Yes. So how do we, yeah. how do we process our, our way of doing things in a, in a manner that doesn't require 20 years of training or an apprenticeship for you to be able to figure out how the hell to do it. And, and that's yeah. been a lot of fun and technology. Like I said, I mean, I, 
found something the other day that's going to, without a shadow of a doubt, save me just per location, 60 to $75,000 a year. Wow. Just for shipping and logistics with one tweak that I never thought of before. So, mm. yeah, but because that was going to be my second question in relation to scaling. And that is either you or, you know, some of your team that you work closely with have an appreciation of looking at that customer that walks in and helping them with their personal brand, even though they might not even be coming in to do that, kind of getting them on that journey. And when you scale, you've got to replicate that formula in other mm -hmm. locations. And that yep. that's going to be tricky. Well, and I think the big thing is keeping people focused on what their, I call it their lane. You know, mm. not everybody's a visionary. And that's something that, like, I value freedom a lot. There are a lot of people that love routine. Yeah. I hate routine. I find routine by default, but don't tell me it's routine or else I'll start bucking the system. <laughs> you know, so it's like my job is visionary, but a lot of people just want the certainty. Hey, this is what I, this is how you win today. And, and like when you're, we're teaching and, and new employees and things like that, it's like, look, this is what you're focused on today. Some people never want to leave out of that or want to stay in it for, for a long time, you know? And it's just like, they want to help a customer, help a customer. It's just focus on the customer in front of you. It's just being present in the moment. Um, mm. I think that that's a big piece of it is just saying, hey, here's where you are. This is how you win. Stay focused right here. And then like, and then as opportunities come up, you can tell them what else to focus on. It's just, I think that's the, the kicker is like incentivizing people by the right metrics so that they can best serve the client, whatever role they're in. And I think, you know, that's whether it's on the operation side or the sales side, it's like, Hey, what are we focusing on? Are we, do you win by having quick turnaround times on orders? And is that what we're going to pay you off of or bonus you off of, or do we pay you off of, um, the number of new customers you brought in or the number of retail sales as a team, you know, it's just yeah. looking at that creative, but that's a, that's a puzzle and a challenge, which means that's exciting for me. Yeah. So it's not scary. But scary would be, uh, being on a hamster wheel doing the same shit every day. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. It's such a joy speaking to you. Uh, so refreshing to hear your ideas and your vision and, thought process around these things it's it's yeah really really cool Thanks. so vaughn are is there something that i haven't asked or something that you haven't shared yet we'll, we'll share your location how people can get in touch in a yeah, minute um, is there something I'll, else that we haven't covered you know i think we're good michael i i would love maybe a follow-up uh one day maybe after maybe a year from now we'll do a little see where we where we've come from from this meeting but um you can yeah. check me out. I'm, I'm most active on Instagram uh, at Vaughn Granger. You can see all my different companies there, uh, VaughnGranger.com. I'll post articles every now and then. You'll see some rants. Uh, but just my mm -hmm. name on any platform, pretty much. So Brilliant. And LinkedIn, you're on. That's Yeah, um, on LinkedIn, like Vaughn Granger. Yeah, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Those are the three I spend most of my time on. Yeah, I wish they stopped inventing all these platforms where we all have to get our profiles. On I just... love Instagram because it's pretty pictures, right? So you'll see everything yeah. from my from me doing jujitsu to me showing you fabrics and everything in between. Um, that's the one I like. That's the one I'm the most active on. So very cool. Well, I'm sure people will go and check it out. Thank you so much for talking about textiles and garments <laughs> and personal branding and storytelling. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for your time. Great. And yeah, let's catch up in 12 months time. Sounds awesome. Take care. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you. Bye for now. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.